Recently, uh, there was a leak that contained some information about ChatGPT4's model architecture. I'm going to go over kind of what all details kind of are within this architecture leak and kind of everything about it. Uh, there's a lot of videos that kind of cover the leak and kind of talking about, I think, different points, but none of them really focus going in depth about the architecture. So in this video, I'm going to kind of go over not only what it is, but code and kind of a current literature review about what the the leak of ChatGPT4 was. And the leak is uh, this mixture of experts. But before we go into it, let's take a step back and kind of talk about kind of how this came about. So the leak originated from Yam. Uh, it's his Twitter account. Uh, the, the information was actually on a site that was kind of behind a paywall. Uh, but this guy leaked this on Twitter. Uh, he claimed that uh, chat GPT-4 details are leaked. It's over. Everything is here, which is <laughs> really funny when you actually look at what the leak is. Uh, it's very hyperbolic. Uh, there's a lot of very uninteresting points that are in this, you know, supposed leak or, or whatever. Uh, I, I have listed them here, uh, and you can go over it if you want. I'm not going to go over it. It's really boring. Uh, but one of the things that's kind of interesting and kind of people are kind of uh, hypothesizing about it seems like uh, OpenAI is using a lot of textbooks data for training, and they probably don't have the rights to this information, but they're doing it anyway, uh, which kind of gives the idea that their legal strategy is kind of like ask for forgiveness rather than permission. They're kind of moving in this gray area of like, can we do this? Can we not do this? There's not rules on the book right now, but it just seems kind of like they're just blitzing uh, why there's this kind of like, you know, unknown territory and we can go back and either pay fines or whatever but it's probably like best if they can achieve like the best model the earliest so i think they're just going full speed and using whatever uh so it's kind of a bold strategy kind of interesting but the the architecture thing and what i'm going to go over and kind of talk about the code is the mixture of experts uh a lot of people i think maybe not kind of very uh, machine learning inclined talk about this and it seems like they kind of conflate it with just kind of normal ensembling. Uh, and it's not exactly what it is. It's, and it's a little bit different. A mixture of experts, uh, they, they kind of just hear the name and think like, oh, like there's like one model that's assigned to coding, one model that's assigned to like philosophy and literature. But that's not exactly how it is either. Uh, this is a thing that's been around for a long time. Uh, 1993, it's been around. And it's kind of really kind of becoming popular because it's a way to uh, boost efficiency. And that's what I actually use it for in, at my job doing missile warnings. Uh, and I'll, I'll get a little bit more into that later. But um, the thing that was leaked is that they used 16 apparently experts, which is kind of like, that's a hyper parameter. That's probably something they didn't want to know. So that's kind of interesting. If it's true, I mean, the, you don't even know if the leak is really correct. Uh, but. Uh, there was a paper that came out uh, the end of last year, uh, so August 2022, and it's towards understanding a mixture uh, of experts in deep learning. Uh, this main thing this, this paper tries to cover is why in the mixture of experts model does it not just collapse to a single model? Uh, they kind of talk about clusters are the underlying problem and non-linearities of experts are pivotal to the MOE success. Okay, whatever, but first let's kind of just talk about what uh, mixture of experts is so the key thing is this router experts are kind of just like copies of the model you so if you have some sort of model let's say transformer or whatever uh cnn you have this router that chooses which uh model gets the information so uh cfar 10 data set you have pictures of different animals uh the router may get a bunny and it's like i'm gonna send that to expert two he's pretty good at knowing this gets an airplane expert who's good at this and then maybe he gets uh, a car and he sends it over here to expert three obviously the router doesn't know exactly what it is uh, but he has an idea of maybe what's in there and knows which expert to send it to one thing that i've kind of seen from like playing with these models is that it, it using especially with the cfar 10 data set is it kind of groups thing and there's like a, a expert among a group so like it seemed to me like all the pictures that have like can maybe like a gat a grassy background so these are like deer and horses it gets sent to one expert that can kind of decipher between those and then ones with like a maybe like a sky background airplane birds get sent to another expert and they decipher among those and this router is is simple enough to be able to tell that and kind of why would you want that uh the thing is that it it improves model efficiency i was using a, an, an ensemble of six models uh for my work 
with missile warnings, and it is so computationally expensive that even though it gets very high performance, it's like very negative to use. Uh, so we were kind of trying to find a way to make the model uh, much smaller, but just as effective. And I implemented a mixture of experts and found it to be very, very effective. Uh, and I, the reason that you get more complexity without having during inference time to have that complexity. So the router is like this very simple model that says, you know, you go here, you go here, and this guy figures it out. Okay, so this is all it is. But it's very interesting how these things learn, and there's a lot of things that made this a bit more complex, and I'll go over those things. So just kind of a list of what's kind of going on. 1994, uh, so before most of us were born, it would kind of came about. Uh, and then you have uh, what kind of happened in the later uh, years, whereas in 2017, so this is around the time when the Transformer just came about, uh, you have kind of some new developments in a sparse MOE, so uh, going back to that, uh, MOE, uh, but originally it just had a router that kind of said which models did what. The sparse MOE kind of selected a subset of, of uh, experts to kind of observe. And then recently we've got into kind of these uh, very transformer-based uh, mixture of experts models that even have some sort of attention. So I, I'm going to open up this paper here, which is over here. And this is what it is. This is the newest thing, uh, 2021, so pretty new. Uh, you can see it has that router that we had seen before. It has a, the router gives a prediction about which model it should use. So that's what these bars are supposed to represent. This one, this one, this one, this one. It says that this one's the best, it sends it here. It brings around that prediction and uh, multiplies it back with the prediction of this model. So it kind of adds kind of a layer of attention and that seems to be what we're doing nowadays. Uh, just add attention everywhere and everything gets better. Uh, I mean, it's not a bad approach. It seems to be working. Uh, so yeah, why not? Attention added onto uh, the router. So it's an interesting approach. I have kind of like the first most, this is the expert that I'm using. Uh, this is what they used in the paper or kind of what they described, uh, which is just a very simple expert. You can see it here, not very much going on. And this is a very simple uh, mixture of experts model. So we have the, the gating network, and then it sends it to the expert, multiplies it by the weights. I, I think that this is kind of uh, speaks for itself. You probably could just look at it a couple seconds and get an idea. I kind of go through the updates as it goes on. Now this paper that I'm, I'm actually talking about here, this is another one. So this is the one that has kind of the, the most new updates, very transformer related. And then here they're kind of, theorizing about why certain things are happening with these mixture of expert models, why they're so effective and why don't they collapse. Um, so I'm going to go into kind of what they found and what they use. And I implemented these things for my model and they worked really well. Uh, so I'm going to share them here. Uh, so with the data set they used in their kind of explanation in this paper is the CIFAR 10 data set. I talked about it before. 10 different classes. You got all of these here. You've probably heard of it before. I have some code about loading the data, um, some training things, training the general model that I talked about before. Uh, here is kind of their explanation of what's going on in the predictions. So you have these different clusters or different experts, and these are the decision boundaries. So you can see how each kind of expert is kind of taking up a different area and uh, has like a totally different kind of set of things that it's predicting on. So it specializes in some way. So that's kind of like the name implies, but it's not something that you kind of hard code. It learns on its own and it's not usually what you think it is. Like mine's not, you know, specializing to certain animals. It's looking at background or something kind of more complex, something a little bit better that the machine learning model comes up with. Now some novel implementations they have is they have a, a, a expert diversification and dispatching loss that they add and stability smoothing. So this is, I have some information about it, uh, but there's two things in this expert uh, diversification and dispatching uh, loss. So this is my model. This is the forward pass. I have some stuff saving some of the information. Uh, here is the, the loss that I just talked about. So what's going on here is you have two sort of losses that come out. 
you have the diversification loss. This one, you're just making sure a model doesn't predict like mainly one class, which can be very bad. And there's some balancing here too, because it kind of, it kind of, uh, it kind of disincentivizes specialization uh, in a lot of ways. So you kind of don't want that in some ways, because this is kind of making the model kind of predict everything. So this is a loss when it starts to predict just only a few things, you get some sort of a curd loss. And then you have a dispatching loss. This is a loss for uh, the the gating, the router. Uh, it's when you send a, an example to an expert that is not good at handling that example, then you uh, apply a loss too. So you want something that can kind of make the router more effective, but also kind of make it a little bit more diverse. Because if you make the router very powerful, you're going to end up with a model that just sends experts to do like a, a single classification. So if you have CFAR 10, 10 experts and a very powerful router and all the losses kind of focused there, then it's just going to send it to the experts and they're just going to do one prediction only each for each expert. Uh, so here you can kind of balance that. There's a lot of trade-offs. It's a bit more complex and kind of maybe how I'm describing kind of like on its face, but that's just a simple kind of understanding. And then there's also this stability and smoothing loss. This is it's very effective, actually. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's not a, a very complicated thing. Uh, in the paper, they kind of talk about exactly why they use it. I mean, you kind of get what's going on is that you'll take an image and you'll add some bit of noise to it. And then you'll pass it to an expert and then you'll reiterate on that. You'll just keep passing it to the expert with different amounts of noise. Uh, so you're changing the image just slightly. Uh, obviously, this is preventing issues like lookup table sort of problems and kind of making just the model or the predictions a little bit more robust, which is kind of needed. It's kind of just like a, a expert specific augmentation, I guess. Uh, but it's needed because, it, I mean, this is like super uh, overfitting uh, type of model to use. Uh, so it kind of stops some of that too. It kind of smooths the predictions out. Uh, it, it is actually uh, probably the most effective thing that came out of like the things that I've applied from this paper. And that is happening here. If you look uh, right here where these noises are at. So you can just compare uh, the MOE from before and this one. If you want to go line by line and see kind of what this average noise noisy output is and how it's kind of looping through them. Uh, and then I have some results. Uh, we kind of jumped in on a, a later epoch here uh, for this model, but let's look at this one. You can see uh, these are different uh, parameters. These are all my experts, and this is kind of the ensemble. You can see it improving over different epochs. I only, I capped it at 45. This model takes a long time to train, and it has a lot of oscillation. I mean, it's kind of obvious why that might be. But you can see it improving over time. It's kind of interesting seeing what the experts kind of oscillate between and kind of what they're kind of learning. Uh, I kind of thought some of the stuff would make maybe a little bit more sense on its face, like when experts doing airplanes and uh, maybe other things that are like human made, like uh, automobiles and trucks. And then one is like doing all the kind of animals, but it's not exactly like that. I think with this data set, CFAR 10, it's matching a lot around the backgrounds. That's like mostly what the the router would see because it has just like such a simple uh, network. Uh, so that's probably just an artifact of a very uh, low level router. Uh, but it'd be interesting to see how that changed when you change different routers. But there's different parameters here. You have the weight of the EDD loss, the alpha value. So which one, your balance of uh, which type you're coming from, are you given the router, more specialization, are you uh, encouraging more diversification? Samples for the smoothing, uh, this is how many times you resample and pass it through, and this is the amount of noise you have. Different things, I have a whole different combination, you get a bunch of different uh, performance here. Uh, so I'm gonna post this, uh, this, uh, this notebook on GitHub, so you can just kinda go over uh, what the mixture of experts model is, but I just kind of want to highlight kind of exactly what this actually is. A lot of people are talking about it, but a lot of people are kind of talking in a way that uh, maybe is not true to what it actually is. Uh, but I encourage you to look at all the papers that I kind of went over. Uh, that kind of gives you a little bit better of an idea. And then also, I think 
if you're really interested in large language models, I'm more kind of computer vision based. So I, this, some of the stuff is not super applicable uh, with the kind of things that are going very into attention of the tokenization, this sort of thing. Uh, some of the stuff is applicable to me, but not directly. Uh, but I think if you're really interested in large language models, I would go read this paper that came out in 2021 up here, um, right here. Uh, it's very interesting. I think this is what a lot of this is based off of. Now, I think one thing that's interesting is that they kind of stated this as everything's over and, you know, is this just like some big like unveiling or leak that happened to uh, GPT-4? But the thing is, this is kind of what you have to use with such large models. So I'm pretty confident that all other companies kind of had an idea that they were using this. I mean, I'm sure they're glad that they can know for sure if this is true, that this is what OpenAI was using. Uh, but I'm pretty sure it's probably pretty common knowledge that most of these tricks for kind of computation reduction are being used. Uh, it seemed like a very good one and it seemed very applicable. So I. I doubt that it's very like groundbreaking relevation, but I think it's something that if you're a machine learning engineer that it's something worth kind of going over. Uh, I'll have some more videos about uh, kind of architectures and, and I'm gonna produce some more notebooks like this. So if you're interested in anything like that, I would consider uh, subscribing.